All right, I'm gonna get started with our welcome. So good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Uh, my name is Sandra Thompson. I'm the event coordinator with the Halifax Chamber, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our Navigating COVID-19 webinar series with our special guests from Simplicity. Today's topic is on crisis management in the hospitality sector. We know the hospitality sector is one of the hardest hit industries throughout this pandemic. This industry has had to make some tough decisions to try and keep businesses running while we wait for things to settle down. In Halifax, the hospitality sector is what makes truly every Halifax experience unique, and it's been so amazing to see how many of you have been able to adapt your offerings to comply with these new restrictions. We've seen trunk pickups, contactless delivery, even online shopping. We've also seen the generosity of this sector with free meals for medical professionals. And the Halifax Chamber will continue to support you in any way we can. Tell us what you're up to, tag us on social media, send us an email, and we'll make sure to share your story. We also have a webpage to gather all the important information regarding COVID-19 in one spot. Um, this includes supports and resources. You can find links to federal government support like the Canadian Emergency Response Benefit for individuals and the new wage subsidy for employers. Check the webpage daily for new updates. It's halifaxchamber.com slash COVID-19. So with all that being said, it's now my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today. Matt Sims with Simplicity Designs has helped more than 350 organizations improve, innovate, and grow. He's worked with clients to shift the organizational paradigm. Matt is here today to speak about crisis management, specifically in the hospitality sector, and to lay out a guide to help lead your team through this and discuss the basis for making a plan around your customers and cash. We will have time to answer questions, so feel free to ask them in the Q&A box below and we will address them as time allows. So let's get started. Matt, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you, Sandra. And I just want to give a big shout out to the Halifax Chamber and the little two page PDF that you folks put out on all of the different financial options. This is probably the most confusing time to try and figure that out as a business owner. And that one that came out is one of the clearest I've seen, if not the clearest I've seen. I've been passing it along. That's a fantastic bunch of work that you guys put together there and a huge service. So thank you for that. Um, folks, uh, over the last four weeks, we have come to the realization that this will be a much longer crisis than anybody wanted it to be and the hardest hit sector is the hospitality sector. I have been working with my friends in the restaurant industry, my friends in the hotel industry, and many others, the alcohol and beverage industry, and helping them navigate this new normal. Uh, and you know, folks, one thing that most people don't know about Simplicity is we spend about 75% of our time helping organizations out of crisis. And so the way in which you navigate crisis and cut through the noise to get to the signal so you can act on the things you need to become critical, even more critical in a time of crisis. Uh, most times, though, we're dealing with companies who are in crisis and the market's fine. When the market is in crisis and the companies are in crisis, what you've done is you've created an exponential number of variables. So you've created way more noise and you got to cut through that in some way. And so what we'll leave you with here today is a brief understanding of what is the likely forecast on this pandemic? What's it look like? How long is it going to be with us? What are the experts saying? Then we're going to talk about the economic impact of that. Then we're going to talk about what that means for hospitality. And then once we get past that, we're going to get to the real meat of this, which says, how do I as a business owner now navigate this new normal? Because things are not going back. So as we, you know, as you said, we've worked with over 400 organizations. Um, and what gets me out of bed every morning is helping other business owners navigate the complexities of running a business. That's what gets me out of bed every morning. So when we went back to the drawing board and said, how are we gonna help the community in this? We totally threw away the paywall to our entry level offering and put it out there to say, hey, let's help as many business owners navigate this. So I always start my talks with safety first. And I do this because normally I'm speaking to entrepreneurs and business owners, which means I'm speaking to those who have risked a lot and don't mind failing. That's awesome, except when it comes to safety. And so what I'm gonna ask you all to do is to think about the most vulnerable person in your family, the person closest to you, the person that you care about the most. What advice would you give them to navigate this? That's the advice I hope you're taking. 
Because as humans, we tend to be overly optimistic about ourselves and we don't tend to put that veil over it and look and go, hmm, what would I tell someone else to do? So folks, I hope that you take a minute, think about your family and you, your team and the most vulnerable because my guess is you're responsible for leading a group. And if you're on the front lines of this, you're responsible for leading a group safely through this. That's a huge responsibility. Okay, folks, this keeps climbing uh, and it's, it's just astronomical how fast it's moving. Um, I gave this presentation last Friday, a variation of it, and total cases in Canada were right around 11,000. We're now at 17,000. I gave this presentation at the start of the week. We're in the mid 200s on deaths. We're now at 345. Folks, this is moving fast, very, very fast. I know from conversations with friends that when Obama left office, somebody asked him, what keeps you up at night? You've had eight years of this. What keeps you up at night? And what he said is the only thing that keeps me up at night. It's not terrorism. It's not wars. It's not the economy. It's a global pandemic. Okay, we've hit it. In a global pandemic, the most important thing is to flatten the curve. And the reason for that is we don't want to rush the healthcare system, right? The healthcare system has constraints, just like every organization. And the constraints in the healthcare system are the number of medical professionals, the number of ventilators, and the number of ICU beds. Those are the three constraints. The three primary constraints we're really concerned with overrunning. So flattening the curve is about dealing with those constraints. Now, What's really important to recognize here is flattening the curve, which I believe I'm on team flatten the curve. It's absolutely critical that we do it in order to save as many lives as possible. As we're flattening the curve, what most people forget in that is we are spreading out the time. What that means is the time that we are dealing with this pandemic over, long, over a concentrated period lengthens. So it's absolutely critical to flatten the curve, but it also means we are gonna have a time, long time period with this. Folks, there's some good news. We have trialed a wet vaccine, world record, 63 days. Uh, but I need you to remember that this is the first and fastest step in what is almost certainly a 16 month process and then many more months to get it to people. Now, this is not from me, this is not my opinion. This is straight out of Bill Gates' last newsletter out where he said 16 months is the fastest we've gone to a new vaccine. Okay, the Gates Foundation is on the front line of this. Remember that we are used to creating vaccines for flus, not for SARS. We are not particularly skilled at vaccines for SARS just yet. So I want to make sure everybody understands the full extent of this. What that means for you is there are going to be three types of environments as a business leader that you need to get used to and as a leader of a family that you need to get used to. You need to get used to pe periods of heightened suppression, which that means like we are today. Don't leave, don't go out. You also need to get used to loosening up, but no vaccine, which means concerns of spread, et cetera. If any of you are reading the news on this and listening to the signal on it, you would have seen, you would have noticed that Hong Kong did a particularly excellent job of not letting it spread. And then they started to loosen things up. And just last weekend, they had to clamp back down because they had too many spread, too many of, too many new infections, okay? Too many new people with the, with the virus. The reason why I'm telling you this is if you listen to anybody, this is the response team in London. They're talking about intermittent social distancing. I'm, I'm, I hate that term, physical distancing. Thank God the World Health Organization went to it because we're all going to need social in this time. But intermittent physical distancing. Gabrielle Lung, University of Hong Kong, Dean of Medicine. Several cycles of tightening and easings before we have a resolution. It doesn't matter where you go on this. Harvard. There, we need to be prepared to do multiple periods of social distancing. 16 to 24 months, folks best case scenario. So that's what you got to think about as you're thinking about leading your business, especially in the hospitality sector, because the hospitality sector relies on people congregating for the most part. It relies on people moving, people going to visit. Okay, folks, this is an indication of how well we're doing. This is what led 
McNeil to say, stay the Blazes home. And the reason why he said it is, folks, I don't know why we think it's a good idea to go to the parks right now. I get that we're stuck at home, but it's not a good idea. PEI and Newfoundland are winning that game. We're not. New Brunswick's not either. Look, plus 95, plus 101%. Folks, do not go to the parks. Stay the Blazes home. I love that campaign. I love that they raised $45,000 over the weekend. They're up to $75,000 of this campaign for frontline workers. It's awesome. Really excited for them. Okay, that is the virus. Now let's talk about your business and the economic outlook. There are other economic crashes, other market crashes that we that people wanted to compare it to. In the beginning, Goldman Sachs, Warren Buffett, almost everybody pointed to 9-11 as an example versus 2008. So when we first did our, our talk on this, Wednesday, the 18th of March, the very first thing we said is, folks, it's not like 9-11 because it happened in March and not September. And you, this group on here, will know this more than anybody. March means the summer. I don't know about your business. I know at Simplicity, we're an organizational design firm that help other companies get out of crisis and scale. We lost 75% of our work. Our seasonal bump comes in March, April, May, and June. Those are the four months where the seasonal bump comes from. I know that if you're in the restaurant industry, I know that last year in Toronto in April, four times the number of restaurants closed because the average temperature outside was five degrees instead of 20, and they lost a month of patio season. I've been into the P&Ls of restaurants, of alcohol beverages, of hotels. They're thin, thin margins. All it takes is one month of five degrees versus 20? What happens when you lose a season, right? What happens when you lose two seasons? What happens when your capacity for a restaurant goes in half, even when you can get back online because of the new physical distancing protocols. How are we going to deal with that? Folks, we're not going back. That's what I need you to really get your head around in this industry. So what's going to be the new normal? What's pricing going to look like, et cetera? That's what you got to start to think about for your business. Now, over the weekend, we moved this prognosis from maybe it's going to be a small dip, like 9-11, to the IMF, and the IMF is not prone to hyperbole, folks. They're not prone to exaggerating things. And this is what came out over the weekend. This is a crisis like no other. We are now in a recession. It is way worse than the global financial crisis of 2008, 2009. And you look at the markets and you look at that slight uptick. And there were some people going, Wuhan's back online after 12 weeks. Italian restaurants are starting to open up a little bit. We're all headed back. Uh, that's a very optimistic statement. Very optimistic statement. Nobody in the medical field, nobody who understands coronavirus, nobody who understands SARS is saying that. So as we move forward with this, I want you to understand the different types of recessions, V-shape, U-shape, and L-shape. And you can take a look at them and understand it. Folks, out of the last one, Greece never recovered. That's the L-shape. That's the one we want to avoid, right? This will rely on the response by our country with economic aid. This will rely on how your industry gets creative and it will rely on how quickly you get creative as a business owner to help recover. Because the one thing that I believe we're going to have is liquidity, All right? Okay, folks, I see someone with a hand up. If you have a question, put it in the Q&A box if you came late. Um, if you have a comment, put it in the comment box, which is awesome. Okay, how to avoid the L-shaped re recession. Here's the data on it. On the medical side, we need long-term suppression until we have a vaccine, then we need a vaccine. On the economic side, we need to put liquidity into hands. The government's working like crazy to do it. Folks, at 10.30 this morning, we have our CFO and a small business accountant walking through each one of the programs at 10.30 to go, what should we do? So you can sign up on our site at simplicity.ca. I want to make sure that you hear it because we're also taking questions. So we have an hour and a half on the line. We're presenting them again. There were 290 people on the last one last week on, when it first came out. And there's news that came out this morning about wage subsidy and how do you manage this? So there's a bunch of programs and offers open for you. And the chamber put out that amazing two pager that they're going to have to redo. And we're going to have to redo everything as we go. But that amazing two-pager, Now, how does that two-pager apply to your business? How you navigate to your business becomes so important and what your strategy is. So folks, Ottawa recognizes this. 
Small business is too big to fail. About 46 to 48% of businesses in Canada are considered small. That's under 250 employees. The hospitality sector has been hit particularly hard. This was the week ending March 14th, which is kind of the week before all this hit. Let's take a look at occupancy and the difference between 2008 and 2020. This is in Stockholm. This is all the data for you to understand what's going on, what you're feeling. Look at demand in San Francisco. This Data Essentials is a wonderful website to go take a look at to understand what's going on in your industry. How are people feeling? What does it look like? Americans are still optimistic. Canadians, not so much. So how do I lead through this? How do I lead through this? This becomes important. So the very first thing that you got to get your head around is that you will go through a hockey stick of some sort. And you're going to have to constantly have your eye on what does the next eight weeks, eight to 12 weeks look like? And what does my business look like under no vaccine virus still out there? And what does my business look like post vaccine? Because here's what I'm going to tell you. There is no situation now where people are saying this is going to last less than three months. So with that in mind, it only takes 66 days to create a new habit. Buying habits will forever change out of this. And in the links that we will send out to you, there is a link on a grocery store and what the four waves of that business are likely to look like. Look like. You're going to have to be mindful in your area of how do I navigate the next eight to 12 weeks? How do I navigate a period of tightening and loosening of regulations? And how do I, what's that mean for me post vaccine? This is an unprecedented time. I know that everybody's saying that, but how do we make unprecedented time mean something to me? Folks, everybody's going to go through a hockey stick. How do I manage it on the way down? And how do I get ready for when the economy bounces back? And it's going to be jagged. It's not going to be a pure hockey stick. The financial crisis of 2008 went on for 19 months. And then we saw the longest bear market in history afterwards. That's not likely to be the same hockey stick. The upward momentum of this hockey stick is likely to be bumpier than 2008. What's it look like for you? And I try to give this visual because you need to think of three different businesses. Heightened security like we have now, clamp down, stay at home. Tightening and loosenings, what's it look like? Post vaccine, what's it look like? Where are the buying habits changing? Folks, they're not likely to go back. And I'll tell you one habit for our family. Grocery store, back to it again, because it's easy and everybody understands it. I knew and always thought that ordering online was a great idea so that when I went to the grocery store, I didn't actually have to go in and buy it. And I could do my groceries when I, did, when I wasn't tired so that I didn't buy 322 Reese peanut butter cups a Friday night. Okay, great. So that's what I knew, but I didn't do it. So I still had that habit loop going until this happened. And you can bet your bottom dollar that our family is now signed up for delivery, which of course we can't get for multiple weeks, but they'll figure that out quick enough. So then we're signed up for pickup. Drops. Folks, this will exacerbate pre-existing trends. And this is troublesome for people in the restaurant industry as well, because I know all of those apps that help you get delivery out take a pretty good premium. That premium is normally all of the profit margin and then some. You have one opportunity now, folks, to reset your prices and rethink your prices with safety in mind. And people are understanding of safety right now. In a pre-COVID world, they didn't care about safety. They didn't really care about it. And I know this because safety and the spread of contagions, the spread of the common flu cost the American economy $25 billion last year. It was just a quiet $25 billion, and that's not even including hospitalization. That's just in businesses. 
Okay? Now, the flu is not so quiet. It's not a flu. It's a virus now. And it's really causing panic. Okay. Think about that for a second in terms of what it means for pricing. Because people will be more lenient with pricing. This is important as you start to rethink your business model. Okay. Never waste a crisis. Your patients are your own. I'm going to rip through the rest of this because we have other webinars that allow you to go deeper on the, on, on the forecast, the plan, and how to execute. But for this point, never waste a crisis. Your patients or your own. This is a chance for you to reset. If you didn't like your business before, don't rebuild it. Rebuild a different one. And I know a lot of business owners who didn't really like the business they had. Well, this is a natural reset point for you. Only 9% of businesses came out of the last recession thriving. That's it. And yet, these were the startups that were founded. Uber, Airbnb, Slack, Pinterest, WhatsApp, Square, Venmo, tons more. So why is it that iconic brands came out of that economic crisis while only 9% of existing businesses could thrive? And it's because existing businesses have an existing model and they keep trying to go back to it instead of realizing it. There's never going back to that. Can't go back to it. What's the new one? What's the new one? Okay, folks, um, some of you who know me will know that uh, I am a recovering academic. And part of that means that I spent a lot of years in school and I've actually read a lot of Darwin. People misquote him all the time. They say that he said survival of the fittest. It's not at all what he meant. And it's not at all how he said it. What he really meant was survival of the most adaptable because it is rarely the strongest or the smartest who survive. It is those who are the most adaptable to change that survive in the long term. And change is always happening. It's just sometimes it hits us faster than others. As you're going through figuring out what your business is going to look like, these are the three mental models I want you to keep in mind for every decision. Safety, liquidity, creativity. Is it safe for customers and colleagues? Will it bring you cash fast enough to matter? There are all kinds of ideas that might be profitable in the long term, but won't bring you enough cash in the short term. Watch out for those ideas. Creativity. Have I thought of all sides? There are three important mental models to get through as you think through this. Okay. Overview very quickly of what we're going to walk through in the next seven minutes. This is how we help organizations manage in a time of crisis. This is how we help them. The first thing is get grounded in why you exist. Because why you exist and what you're trying to build in the long term probably hasn't changed. How you're going to do it has changed dramatically. We will give everybody a copy of this, the organizational hedgehog. Do you understand what you're passionate about? What gets you out of bed? Do you understand what you're the best in the world at? And do you understand the financial model that keeps you sustainable? I put those three in front of you because it was this that guided us in this time of crisis. We exist to make the world a better place, one organization at a time, focused in Atlantic Canada. We are the best in the world or among the best in the world at helping companies get out of crisis and helping them scale. Our financial model is totally upended right now. We will do about yeah, 65% of our targets that we started out with. Okay. Have to rework it. But we're reworking it, and with the aid package and our access to liquidity, we have figured out how to have cash in the business. Took a long time. Okay. Once you figure out why you exist and what you're trying to build, and you're grounded in that, and it's driving your actions, and it's your North Star, there is an iterative process that every learning organization that we've been a part of goes through. They make a forecast for customer cash and constraints. They make a plan of what they're going to cut, control, and continuously improve, and then they execute that plan. And when they execute it, the theory of what they thought was going to happen doesn't equal what happens, and they learn, and they do it all over again. So you go from forecast to plan to execute. You execute, you learn. You go back to change the forecast, rejig the plan, execute. It's a circular motion. It's an iterative process. It's the learning loop, quite frankly, right? You all need to become a learning organization at this point. So let's get to the forecast very, very quickly. Folks, remember, every week, Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday at 1 p.m., we have webinars that go deep on the forecast, deep on the plan, and deep on the execute. 
Okay, so next week, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we will go forecast, plan, and execute. So I'm going to only spend three minutes on each one of these. If you want more, we have it, and it's for free. It's not, this is not the paywall. It's for free. Come join us if you want to at simplicity.ca. Okay, forecast. Customers cash constraint. There are the three forecasts I've got to do. Before you act, before you do anything, I need the forecast. First one is for customers. How many customers are buying what over what period of time? I need to know that because I need to understand what kind of business I'm going to have. Okay, I get to the forecast of customers. Now, normally I would spend five or six minutes on this. I don't have time to spend that today because I want to get to your questions. But this is the start. If you don't start with the customer forecast and how much you're going to sell to who over what time period, the rest of the activity doesn't matter. It's useless. It's useless without a forecast of customers. So how much are you going to sell to who over what period of time? You need to know that. I move from there to the forecast around cash. And the forecast around cash, in a time like this, everybody goes to cash accounting, okay? And the cash is very, very simple. How much cash do I have in the bank? And how much credit do I have access to? Great, there's your lump of money you can go get. Now, what's your burn rate? How much is going out every week? And how much is coming in? That's what you gotta understand. How much is going out? How much is coming in? That's what you gotta understand every week because I gotta see it over eight weeks. I gotta see it over eight weeks. Okay, the third forecast that almost no one does, and I hope you do it. Where are your single points of failure? And there are three single points of failure that I wanna make sure that you always consider. Supply chain. Where are you, where's your inventory levels for whatever you need? Where's it coming from? We have a number of customers that looked at this and on week one went, uh-oh. I need stuff from the US, I need stuff from China. I've got all kinds of customers. They want me to do the work. I can't get the supplies. So take a look at your supply chain. Anything that you had to manage your supply chain before, min maxes are totally out the window. And I see a lot of people cut inventory to save cash and then they can't do the work so they can't make any cash. You gotta watch out. Don't cut your nose off to spite your face in these times. Okay, the other two single points of failure. The other two single points of failure are skill sets and minutes per week you have of those skill sets. Because everything gets compressed in a crisis. It means I need, at Simplicity, for example, when we first started this four weeks ago, we had one person who knew Zoom. Now we have over 10 who are fully trained in supporting on Zoom. Had to. We had to reskill very, very quickly. That was part of our continuous improvement plan. But where are your single points of failure? Where are they? Okay. The plan, the triple C plan comes down to what are you going to cut? What are you going to control? What are you going to continuously improve? So after I get my forecast of customer cash and constraints, I now move to my cut control continuously improve plan. Cut is what are you getting rid of? What, and go to the fixed expenses on this one, folks. Go to the fixed expenses. Look for stuff like subscriptions, books. I put books in there because um, I have a bad habit of buying books. We spend about six to $10,000 a year on books so we can keep up to date. Um, and uh, well, I'm not buying books right now. That's cut out of the budget. When we went to our fixed expenses, we found $30,000 annualized that we could cut out of the budget. You all have this. It all creeps in. Okay. Then get to the control. What can you put good controls around? Our IT spend through this has actually gone up. People need two monitors. They need stuff to work from home. But you can bet your bottom dollar that we are watching every dollar that goes out. Okay, so what are you going to control? Finally, what is on the continuously improve list? And this one kills me that people don't use this lever. There, this lever needs to be looked at because what could you make go faster, better with less resources? That is almost more important than the control and the cut. Every high performing organization that came out of 2008, 2009 and came out thriving that existed before had some form of continuous improvement program that they were using and using effectively to manage the downturn of the hockey stick and get them ready to drive. Toyota 2008 brought everybody in from the night shift and said, we're going to put you on improvement. The other automakers just cut the night shift. Now you have to have a whole bunch of cash if you're going to do what Toyota did, but you don't have to have a whole bunch of cash to invest in continuous improvement because you got minutes and you got people and folks, this wage subsidy is going to give you an opportunity to bring people back. Okay. What are you going to have them focused on? 
This right now is a 10 week opportunity with the wage subsidy to drive improvement so you can build the business of tomorrow. This is a golden opportunity, but it's gonna be time fenced. Okay, final step, sequence the list. Okay, sequence the list. And that brings me to the last part of, we said forecast, plan, now execute. Execution comes down to this. I take that sequence list that we talked about and I get it in order. Now I need to execute that list, which means people need to know what to do with their minutes. As a team, we need to align on that. So this is the golden rule in, age, in, in yeah, this is the golden rule in execution. Up the cadence. And what I mean by that is, if you used to meet on something once a month, meet once a week. If you used to meet once a week, meet once a day. If you used to meet once a day, meet four times a day. Increase the cadence of meetings. And we are sending out a bunch of meetings. We used to meet on AR once a week. We now meet on AR once a day. We used to meet on sales direction. Once a week, we now meet once a day. The scheduling process, the one that kills most organizations that we work with. We used to meet on that once a month to look out 12 months and once a week to look out eight weeks. We now meet once a week to look out 12 months and once a day to look out eight weeks because too much is changing. Too much is changing. We have to learn quicker. That's why you increase the cadence of meetings. By the way, once you do that, what do you do? you end up increasing the alignment because everybody knows what's important, which therefore means your communication problem goes away because you don't have 300 stories going along. You got one. And you all know what needs to be done that day. It's amazing how this can bring a team together if you let it. Okay. Folks, just a quick note before I, before I sum this up. Um, compassion is needed more than ever right now. Mental health just surpassed COVID-19 as the number one search on Google. The pandemic is giving people a chance to lead who would have never gotten it for a decade. Celebrate them. I know in our organization, I don't think anybody on the marketing team is over 28. They've had to step up in a way they would have never gotten an opportunity to and my God, are they ever doing it? It's amazing. It's amazing to watch people with no marketing experience taking their own time to read how this should go down and support marketing. It's unbelievable. It's amazing to watch people in who had some idea of IT become experts in Zoom. It's amazing. If you go back to why, and that's what I started this talk with, you will clarify your purpose. Once you clarify your purpose, you can connect that to people in a way that is unbelievable. When you connect it to purpose, when you're connected to purpose like that, it's amazing what kind of workers you get. Folks, walk around that grocery store. Look at the workers in there. They have a renewed sense of purpose. They know how important their job is. I have never seen a degree of intent and professionalism out of a group of workers than I have the two times I've walked around the grocery store since this, had come, since this has come up. I had to go for a couple of emergency supplies. Okay, folks, we're gonna need a lot of compassion because we're all gonna hit the walls. We're all gonna go through that emotional curve. We're gonna hit walls at different times. I hope that you have it for your people because we all have different levels of intensity we can go at. We all have different levels of grit we have. We all have different adversities we've faced in this world. It's gonna take a lot of empathy and a lot of compassion. One of the upsides of all these Zoom calls is that if you can see yourself, you're 67% more likely to do the right thing. And what's amazing is when you can see yourself, you don't get as ornery on calls. So make sure when you're working together that you find some video format because it's amazing how much more empathetic you can be in this video world. It's amazing. Okay, folks, we're all getting grounded in the physiological and safety layers of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Pretty soon, we're gonna desperately need that belonging. This is where groups like the chamber become very, very important. How do they create a sense of belonging? How do they help people? And we're gonna need that. The hospitality industry is another area that creates belonging. You have an incredible opportunity to take your clients, take your tribe, create community around it, find out what they need and pivot your business to service that while creating community. We're just coming to terms with the fact that this is a marathon. For a lot of people, that's very, very difficult to think about. 
they're going to need community more than anything else. And you had community before. What are you doing to galvanize your community, to bring your community together? The best are already on that, right? Wrap up with that, right? Forecast, plan, execute. Forecast, plan, execute. Learn, reforecast, replan, execute again. That's all any of us can do in this. Anybody who tells you that they have a playbook and a magic wand is full of shit. But they may have a set of mental models that'll help you make decisions quicker and learn from them. That's all any of us can hope to do in a time like this. In fact, for the most part, it's really all any of us can hope to do in any time. It just happens to feel more cataclysmic right now. Okay. We will send out the final thoughts. Look at next steps. We will send you the links worth reading. The two I hope you read are on the grocery store, and I hope that you read the three secrets from the Navy SEAL. Those articles will take you a total of 10 minutes to read. They changed my life in this crisis. I hope they change yours as well. Folks, this morning at 10.30, we have experts in the AM. Then we have our Cut, Control, and Continuously Improve webinar at 1 p.m. today. And at 1 p.m. Thursday, we have the Execute um, one-hour webinar. And then all next week, same thing. We go back at it. How do you forecast? How do you plan? How do you execute? Longer in depth. That's it for me in terms of the one-way diatribe. But where this becomes amazing is your questions. Where it becomes amazing is your question. So if you have some questions for me now, please, please put them in the Q&A. This is where it becomes real. This is where I awkwardly wait for some questions to come out. Thanks, Sandra, for joining us. Yeah, while we're waiting, um, I do have a question. I was wondering what your views are currently on the federal and provincial support initiatives to date, um, and if you feel they're sufficient to kind of help the hospitality industry through this. Yeah, you, you want to record that and you want to ask me that, eh? Thanks, Sandra. That's nice. Um, <laughs> yes. You know, no, to, to be perfectly honest, we're all learning in this time period. And I believe that the federal government, the liberal government, and the provincial government in particular here in Nova Scotia have responded admirably. Um, this is, I mean, they went very, very quickly to flatten the curve, stay the heck home, and trying to provide some degree of liquidity for people. I mean, folks, 75% of your wage is higher than what you would make on disability and you're stuck at home. So the, the, the reality is, is as long as we can help most people get to that 75% wage subsidy while we figure this out, there's going to be all kinds of liquidity. And as long as we listen to the health professionals, we can flatten this curve and do better than most regions. And I think they've done an amazing job at the two most important things. I do believe, though, that they're going to have trouble in the long term because some of the financial opportunities, deferrals, for example, deferrals and big term loans are going to just absolutely eat small and micro businesses 12 to 36 months from now, right? Because they can't, they're not going to be able to afford to pay back the loans. So that's, that, that's going to be a serious problem, uh, not in the immediate future. So I think their response is, is pretty great. The, the, the issue that we're running into is how quickly can they get the cash in hand? So I know if we weren't able to take out a BDC loan in the magnitude of half a million dollars very, very quickly, we would have a tough time navigating this from a liquidity standpoint. Because three to six weeks to wait to get that in your bank account to pay your people is almost impossible for small and micro business owners. Right. So there's there, there's a double edged sword to it. It doesn't matter what they do. What I'm amazed with and so thankful is they have acted and they're willing to learn on what they've acted instead of trying to get it right before they announce it. Because if they had waited, we'd all be in so much more trouble. Right. I mean, you, you could see it. They, business owners had no choice but to go to layoffs and the layoffs went, oh, we got to keep people at work. And that wage subsidy helped flatten at least the sensitivities for a little bit. Okay, how can we create community virtually? Uh, I think the same tenets of how you created it physically work. They really do. It's, but it's a matter of understanding. I worked with a physiotherapist uh, last night. I was on the phone at, or I was on Zoom at, I think it was nine o'clock. And she was talking about how just reaching out to find out what they need. What's amazing is if you just reach out to say, how can I help? you will find out what your community needs. Now, one of the challenges for a number of business owners is going to be that they have multiple communities they service. And they're going to have to figure out which one matters more to their business in this time and how I over deliver to the community that really matters. This is a very hard time to be a generalist. It's a very hard time because nobody feels like they're getting benefit from you. 
So how do I pick one or two of those communities and over service them and grow them? They're going to tell you though. They're going to tell you what they need. They're going to tell you what they need. Got a number of uh, business owners. I mean, Sober Island Brewing uh, is doing an amazing job of reaching out to their clients and doing deliveries all down, uh, like all over Nova Scotia, one day a week that they're just delivering their amazing stout. And, and, and how are they doing that right now? They can't seem to get the online thing to work. Literally, you're texting the owner. Great. People will deal with that for a couple of weeks and they want to support small businesses. So don't wait till it's perfect to get going. Figure out what your tribe needs, figure out what your community needs, and figure out how to do a good enough job and then commit to getting better at it with that learning loop. This is not a good time for perfectionists. Any other questions, folks, as we get into this? Other questions? One thing I'll make a note of then if there aren't, we'll, we'll get to questions, I'm sure, in a, a few more. But folks, if you found this at all useful, if you found this at all useful, what I'm asking is that you make a donation to the IWK Foundation. The IWK will be the hospital that takes our most vulnerable as they get displaced from all the other hospitals in Atlantic Canada. And it, it is where the most vulnerable go today um, and the most vulnerable children and women go today. Um, I am hopeful that if you found any, I'm suggesting a hundred dollar donation, but you, you figure out what works for you. Even a $25 donation would be amazing. So if any of what we've done here or any of what we do for you over the next couple of weeks for free helps, please, please reach out to our frontline workers in the IWK foundation. This link will go out. Um, so you can, you can donate. Sandra, you had a question before I went into that IWK spiel. I think you're on mute. Uh, yes, um, just a, a quick one. We know life eventually will go back to normal, um, but there are going to be fears and anxieties that remain at high. So I'm wondering um, how we can kind of mitigate these worries. As so if you listen to the experts, there is no situation where they talk about it going back to normal. They talk about a new normal where everybody has a degree of concern around safety that is heightened. If, actually, if you listen to pandemic experts, what they'll say is they're surprised it took this long and they believe we'll deal with multiple of these in our lifetime in different ways. So safety will become a major concern. And if you're in the hospitality area, not only will the reality of safety be important, but the perception of safety will be important. I wouldn't own a restaurant without 300 of those hand washing machines absolutely everywhere. And I, you know, that little that little sign that we all used to laugh at that said employees must wash hands before they go back to work, a little one that was over the bathroom sink, um, that's not going to be enough in the new normal. You're going to be scrutinized for how you wipe down a table. You're going to be scrutinized for how your servers keep themselves clean. There's going to be an added degree on that, and you're going to have to deal with both reality and perception. You have to deal with both in this. Now, I've mostly catered this talk to hospitality, but every business is going to have to go through this. Every business is going to have to think about what does the, what does the customer facing area look like? What does the back area look like? I know that in the sign shop we own, it has taken an enormous amount of effort to get that place to a place where we all feel safe, including our colleagues who work there, right? How do we, how do we actually feel safe? And you're going, Matt, you have a sign shop. Why is that still open? Uh, it's open because there's COVID-19 signage that needs to be done up to help people help the essential services. And we're also producing face shields for the hospitals out of there. So, you know, you go, okay, we got to go in there, but we still have to maintain physical distancing. There's all new training protocols. There's new signage. There's mirrors you got to put up. It, it, it is not going to be easy to figure out what that new normal is, especially in the pre-vaccine area. I do believe that in the post-vaccine era, era, we'll have a little, we'll, we'll go back a bit, but in the pre, I, it's that 12 to whatever, 36 months is gonna be quite something to manage. Any other, um, any other questions? This is, this is a shockingly few amount of questions, which either means I've just thrown way too much at you in a period of time or not. Folks, if you want, this slide deck, if you want access to this recorded version of the webinar, just send us an email at info at simplicity.ca and we'll get the slide deck out to you immediately. This is not meant to be hidden behind a paywall. 
We'll get this to you so you can consider the models. We do that after every one of our webinars. So just info at simplicity.ca if you want it, we'll make sure to get it to you. Uh, Jeff, sure. Uh, Jeff's got his hand raised. So either, why don't we give him speaking rights? There we go. I think we, yeah, we brought him in. Jeff, view him. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Matt. Um, I've, I've been reading um, online, and I guess I don't know what to believe online, and, and reading Fair. some stuff that says that probably 25 to 30 percent of restaurants will not survive. Do you have any predictions on that whatsoever? That's the, uh, that's the best case scenario I've read so far. Uh, most are predicting greater than 50% won't survive. Um, but remember, you're not the average, right? And, and this is where the dangerous thing comes in. You, you don't have to be one who doesn't survive if you're in that industry. But you're going to have to figure out how to interact with your clients in a new way with your brand. So what's that mean? You know, what that what does that mean? That means get to know your tribe, and you know tribe is an overused word, but get to know your best customers. Get to really know them because I can tell you that after four weeks at home, I I I wish I can tell you how many restaurants have reached out to me so far. Zero. I'm shocked. I used to go to them all the time. There's a bunch that have my email address. I am shocked that somebody hasn't personally reached out to me to say. You know, what are some of the pressures you're, you're facing? I've had to reach out to a few who have figured out how to get me food. I just, I, I am absolutely shocked that restaurants haven't figured out how to send me an email and say, we are now delivering or you can pick up. Do you want to play? We're four weeks into this, right? So this is, this is what I would be doing if I owned a restaurant. And this is what I have advised my friends who own restaurants. And they're all in the middle of trying to figure this out, right? In the beginning, most restaurant owners went, it's cheaper to be closed. And it was. But with a 75% wage subsidy, they're giving you a golden opportunity to figure out how to play in this new world. I hope that most restaurant owners take that on and understand what's going to, because it's going to have to be a lot more delivery and you're not going to want 30% going out the door to the people who already figured delivery out. You're going to want to figure that out with your clients. So I'm going to go to the, does that help, Jeff? Yes, thank you very much. Okay, awesome. Um, and feel free, info at simplicity.ca goes straight to my inbox. So I know there are 30 some out of you on here. So if I get 30 emails afterwards saying, I would like you to order from me, I'll get to you one at a time because I'm ordering, I will be ordering from you. Okay, suggestions and recommendations for how hotels can get ahead of this, especially for those that are currently closed. Yeah, so hotels are, you can see that some of the, some of the hotels have turned into bunking areas. In London, they convinced the, uh, they convinced the, the city to pay for the homeless to be able to stay there. Um, in uh, Halifax, I believe the Marriott is housing the Navy. There's going to be some opportunities in this immediate vortex where there are no visitors to work with some organizations who still need your service. Have you had those conversations? If you haven't, you know, I'd be having them right away because I, I mean, travels and hotels are, they're not coming back online for a bit. I mean, I, I believe anybody who's in the game of fixing backyards is going to, it could have one heck of a two summers coming up, but hotels that are currently closed, the real thing you got to ask yourself is this, what is the level of profitability I need to get to, which is, to, which is percent filled? How am I going to get there when people aren't just going to call me and book, which means I'm going to need different relationships with organizations. Okay, I'm going to go to the hotel one and I'll come back up to you, Leah. Hotel conventions and meeting market limit, limit with five people max. When should we start looking at this segment of the business again? Tracy, I, I, I really don't know when this is going to come back online in a meaningful way. Uh, but I would want to know who are the fast movers. If I, was, if I was starting from scratch in this, I would look at the customers who are going to be the first to want to get up and, up and going, and I would want to have my pulse on that. So if you deal with a couple hundred different people, I know we rent hotels and, and rooms, uh, not rooms as per se, but um, areas where we can host guests. I don't know that we'll ever go back to it, to be honest. 
I've had a number of people since we moved online say, please don't make me go anywhere and park again. This is, this is way better. So interesting on that one. So somebody just asked, oh, so I'm going to go to Leah. If you could only give a restaurant one piece of advice during this time, what would it be? I think I just gave it. I'll give it again. Your tribe. Know your tribe and figure out how to over deliver to those best customers. Every organization has a top 25% of customers. If you don't know who they are, you don't know your business. Who are your top 25% of customers and how do I over deliver to them? That's what I need to know because that's your customer base. Where are they? Okay. Best delivering ordering software options for businesses not currently offering. Nick, I think I could make a lot of money if I knew that answer. I am, I am trying to help a number of them who are using different options and I wouldn't openly suggest any of them yet because they've all been painful. Um, they've all been painful so far. I haven't had anybody with pineapple. Thanks you, thank you, Leah. I haven't had anybody on the pineapple side. Um, I, 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 how are you, Leah? Maybe you can jump on here. This is, th let's make Leah a panelist. This, that's actually, a, now I know who Leah is. I didn't see your last name. Leah, can you tell us a little bit of what Pineapple's doing? Let, unmute yourself. And how are you managing this mass movement online with online delivery? Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, for those that don't know me, I'm, I own Pineapple Bites, which is, we are a uh, a uh, restaurant technology provider, um, partner of NCR, which is the largest provider of restaurant solutions. So one thing that NCR has done is they're offering free implementation of online ordering. So if somebody has Aloha software, NCR will actually do the programming for free right now to get them a very basic online ordering website. Uh, and then what I'm thinking is sa same as what you just said, you know, skip the dishes and Uber Eats are going to take a huge chunk of the bottom line. So find someone on your team who can change what they do and get them to deliver it. Right. But use online ordering through a, a very simplified, you know, small menu, just your, your big ticket yep. that everybody wants. Um, so for clients out there that don't have Aloha right now, I mean, we'd be happy to help anyone. We could probably get some people into Aloha on a, on a very basic level. Um, you can put it on various different hardware. So it's, it's worth looking into. No question. Leah, can you put your, I, I never do this. I've done this twice so far. I did it once with Sober Island Brewing. I'll do it with you. Can you put your email address in the chat there uh, so that we have it and we'll throw it in the, uh, and I'm only doing that because I have seen your work uh, and I didn't know you guys were moving that quickly at that pace. So that's, that's fantastic. Um, notice that Leah Booty at uh, pineapplebites.ca. Uh, I love that last piece of advice you gave. Get extremely specific over what menu items you have that travel well and get good at delivery. Because any restaurateur who has not become a delivery service with easy payment options is gonna lose in the midterm, right? So what travels well? Okay, John, it's a challenge to stay open when you can't follow the health directives. For example, I don't know where my staff have been or what they have been doing and vice versa. And the space does not allow proper separation, not even close. I have to keep my customers and employees safe and me too. I wish all non-essential services like takeout restaurants would have been forced to step back as well. Thoughts? Uh, well, you have a firm opinion held firmly there. Uh, I'm not going to jump into that one other than to say I agree with you 100% that it needs to be safe. Um, and I believe that we have also chosen to help flatten the curve. I've also seen restaurants who can adhere to the safety protocols, which is hard, I get it, but I've been in the kitchens, who can adhere to the safety protocols and deliver effectively. Regardless of it's now or later, John, until there's a vaccine, you're going to have to figure this, this conundrum out. So while it's a heightened risk, We've got to be even more careful, but you got 12 to 16 months of figuring this out. And there's not enough money in the government coffers for them to just drive money out into the market that's not being circulated in the economy. So I would want to understand, but I, I, I'm 100% aligned with you, the safety thing. I started with the flatten the curve, absolutely. If you don't have a kitchen that can handle it, can't do it. But can I rent a kitchen? What can I do? Can I offer something that's not a kitchen? Can I do some different pre-mades? What can I do to service? It's not just an either or. This is not a binary. This is not a time to jump into binaries. This is a time to understand how to do things differently and safely. 
that's the time to jump into. Any other questions, folks, as we, it's not often that through the question period, we increase the number of people who are on here. Um, any other questions? That, okay, folks, if we don't have any more, it's 957. Info at simplicity.ca gets you access to the video of this webinar and this slide deck. We'll add Leah's contact in there um, going out. Anything else that we can help you with, folks? I'm not on the clock. I'm answering somewhere between 80 and 120 emails every night to help business owners just to sort problems, big or small. Uh, this is a time for us to lean on each other and help each other out. And if you have a great delivery option, please send it to me as well because I'm getting sick of eating my own cooking. Actually, not my own cooking. I probably shouldn't even say that. That shouldn't be recorded because my partner and I are going to see this later. That's not going to work out for me. Thanks, Sandra. <laughs> Thank you so much, Matt. Thanks for joining us, sharing all that information and answering all of our questions. Um, we, as the Chamber, are hosting more webinars all week. We have experts in mental health, professional services, sales, banking, and more. So you can head to the Halifax Chamber website at halifaxchamber.com slash events for the full lineup. Um, as Matt said, this webinar has been recorded. Uh, the slides and everything will be available. So we will send that to attendees shortly. Thanks again for joining us and have a great day, everyone.